Good early evening, colleagues, and welcome uh, to everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce Professor Gulam Sawar, who's giving one of uh, several inaugural lectures within the faculty. So Gulam gained his BSc in Physics from University College London, followed by an MSc in Actuarial Science from City University London. He then went on to work on the derivatives desk of Abbey Life Investment Services in Bournemouth. Whilst there, he decided to do a PhD in finance, specialising in financial derivatives, with the intention that post-completion, he would work in the city. Brackets, earn a lot more money, close brackets. Yep. Um, needless to say, those best laid plans did not always come to fruition. In his own words, he became an accidental academic. On completing his PhD, Gulam was appointed as a lecturer of finance and accounting at the University of Stirling. He then moved to Cardiff University, and in 2005, Gulam moved to the University of Nottingham as a senior lecturer. Gulam jokingly refers to this movement between Scotland, Wales, and England as a form of national service. Gulam's next move was to the University of Salford in 2013 as a professor of finance. And Gulam joined Keel as Professor of Finance and Head of Economics, Accounting and Finance in June 2020. Gulam's research specialises in the valuation of complex financial instruments, such as bonds and options and risk management. His earliest research focused on modelling debt using advanced computational methods. This was followed by work on risk management of complex derivative products. He, was published, he has published extensively in these areas in the mainstream financial journals. In recent years, he's focused, refocused his research to new areas, including modeling climate change and machine learning. Today, Gulam will provide us with an, a panoramic, panoramic view of history through the financial instrument of debt. He will attempt to show how debt has played an important role in history, and even today, debt plays a critical role in the cost of living crisis. So, without further ado, I introduce Professor Gulam Sowa, whose inaugural lecture is entitled A Short History of the World According to Debt. Uh, thank you very much for this um, very kind introduction, uh, Donna. So, um, when, I, when I actually thought about this inaugural lecture, what I thought, well, I can be very uh, smart and very boring, or I can be very dumb and very interesting. So I kind of went for the latter option. So I kind of see it very much as a form of banter uh, amongst colleagues. So when it comes to debt, debt is really something that is with us from the moment that we are born to the moment that we die. We don't think in that way. So for example, if you are born in, at a hospital, you can be sure that hospital was built on debt and when we die, you can, it can be, if, you're, uh, uh, if you're cremated, that crematorium was actually paid for by borrowing. Or if you're actually uh, buried, you can be sure that this was also against debt. So it, it is something that actually stays with us for a whole of our life. So the question is, how did it actually come into being? And what is its significance? And in a sense, if you take a sort of very broad view from the earliest day to today's, it, 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 it's kind of like one of the foundational bases of our civilization. So let me kind of start with a very famous quote from James Carville, who was one of the uh, presidential advisors of the Democratic Party in the 1990s. And he said, well, I used to think that if there was reincarnation, I wanted to come back as the president uh, of, or the pope or as a point for a baseball hitter, but now, I would like to come back as the bond market. You can intimidate everybody. And as Liz Truss found out to her cost, that is so. So what is the actual origin of debt? But historically, what we find is that the earliest records that we have, they're very patchy records, is that they actually go back to summer in southern Mesopotamia around 3200 BC to 2500 BC. And in essence, that debt was owed to the king. So it would essentially involve a form of taxation or other forms of payment 
to the king. Now, what then would happen is that these debts would actually pile up over time. So what the kings then would do is every time there was a new king coming to the throne, they would have a period of consolation. They would say, right, I am the king. This is the flame of liberty. Your debt is forgiven. And that is how they actually would deal with debt in the ancient world. So it didn't become the destructive force that it is today to a large extent. Okay? So it was still a very creative force. And what those constellations meant was that any debt that was owed to the royal palace uh, in terms of agrarian debts, debt would be actually forgiven. Anything that involved a bond servant, so for example, a person who owes the debt may actually uh, have to give up his wife or his children or his servants uh, to the other person, that would be then also uh, for, uh, given. And more importantly, any land which they actually had to uh, uh, parcel out because of that debt would also be given back to them. So what that meant was that everything would more or less be set back to base zero. Okay? So and in essence, what it meant was there was always a dynamic tension between the king and the merchants and the entrepreneurs and the priestly class. Because the merchants and the entrepreneurs wanted to actually take over that collection of debt themselves from the king. Okay? And very often that would actually lead to some sort of civil war. In some cases, the king would win. In other cases, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the merchant class would win. Uh, or in some cases, because the state was weakened, barbarian armies would come in and actually take over the state. Okay. So this is scenario sort of very much lasted until classical um, antiquity. So you're kind of looking at, say, from around five, uh, 800 BC to 500 AD. So during that period, what happened was those ideas of regular debt cancellation ceased to be. Okay. And the idea of cyclical time, as in the ancient period, was replaced with the idea of linear time. And that meant that there was no debt cancellation. Over time, an aristocracy um, grew, and they replaced the king. And that then ended the tradition of uh, cancelling debt. And over time, what that meant was there was more and more polarization. So the idea of clean slates, in essence, ceased to exist during the late classical period. Okay? So what would happen is that the creditor olig oligarchies appropriate most of the land and reduced much of the population to bondage. Okay? And that meant that they actually became powerful and took over political control. Okay? And then that also meant that the, the burden of debt and the resulting increase in interest led to uh, foreclosures of land. So effectively, land was also taken over. And in time, that meant the debtors lost their liberty. So when we actually sort of go to around, say, 476 CE or AD, uh, that would be the year that Rome actually fell. But with hindsight, what actually happened was there was prior to that a civil war, if you like, in, not a violent one, but a kind of civil war within Rome where there was really a clash between the landowning classes and the common populace. And the landowning of the merchant classes won, and that meant there was essentially no debt reprieve. And over time, that meant really society just became weakened. The tax base was destroyed. People left Rome. And when the barbarians kind of went in, it was more or less empty. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, within the Roman Empire, you had the Byzantine Empire and you had the Western Roman Empire. So if Rome fell in 476 AD, the Byzantine Empire only fell in 1453 AD. So roughly, it outlasted the Western Empire by 1,000. And one of the reasons one can argue why that happened was that they... Uh, uh, the Byzantine Empire, in essence, went back to the earlier system of debt cancellation. So there wasn't this polarization 
of, of wealth in society. So, in essence, what we have then is, uh, in terms of history, a, if you like, a some sort of tussle between, or some sort of interaction between debtor versus creditor. Who wins? Does the debtor win or the creditor win? So within, the bronze, within if you like, the uh, Bronze Age, uh, Mesopotamian, or um, the Byzantine Empire, or the Babylonian Empires, it was the debtor's hard right. Okay? So because the central rulers were focused on collecting taxes and maintaining land tenured military force, they, it was in their interest to cancel debt on a regular basis so that those people would actually stay on their line, they would work, and they would actually uh, pay their taxes, provide corvy labor, and also fight in the armies. Okay? And that also meant there was constant conflict with the powerful families who actually wanted to take all this over. Okay? So by the time we actually uh, hit uh, classical Greece or Rome, though the king has been more or less weakened, and if you like, the powerful families have taken over, and that meant there was no debt cancellation. And this is the legacy which we have inherited from Rome. In our system today, this, everything favors the creditors, not the debtors, unless the debtors are a powerful state. So we've seen what happened during the 2008 financial crisis, and we're actually now seeing what's happening with Sri Lanka and with Pakistan. So the basic maxim has been that debt that can be paid won't be paid. And so what we're now going to look at is some other examples in more recent history of where that has happened. So when we actually uh, look at the ancient world, there wasn't really any further debt innovation until we actually come to the uh, modern, if you like, to the uh, Italian uh, republics. So L. Hamilton, who was one of the founders of economic history, said that national debt is one of the few important economic phenomena without roots in the ancient world. So up to that point, up till the, if you like, the uh, Italian squabbling republics or merchant republics, idea of a national debt didn't really exist. Now the king, of course, could borrow money, but that was very much in the personal capacity. But it wasn't really to the state. Now, the Italian states, the city-states, were con given that they had a small population, they were fighting against themselves, and they were also, if you like, fighting against the major empires of that time, they needed to fund mercenary armies. And what they did was essentially innovate their borrowing requirements. So they would actually borrow against the state and then pay it back over time. So the first such innovations took place in Genoa around 1149. So that, this would be kind of like the bond issue we, uh, t as we do today. That was followed by uh, Venice in 1164, and uh, then Florence in 1166. So this debt, again, caused problems. And again, it led to uh, debtor versus creditor wars. So what those debts effectively meant was there was redistribution of wealth from the bottom to the top. And very often, the people who would issue those debts would also be the people who are running the state. So in essence, you know, they were fighting those wars, but the people who were paying for those wars were, if you like, the common people. Okay, so, so to summarize, the profits derived from the state's uh, interest payments tended to flow into the pockets of the politically powerful merchant class. Okay? And that meant it was a very regressive consumption and land taxes. And what that meant was there was a heavy uh, uh, burden on what was called the popular minuto, or the little people. So in other words, the little people, through the instrument of debt, paid for those wars. Okay? And over time, it meant that you formed a oligarchy of bond-holding elites who were very often the people who were running the state. So, what was, the con what was the consequences of that? Well, the consequences of that was constant, if you like, civil wars, riots, and in, uh, and in some cases, book burning. So the first one we have record is Genoa in 1339, when people just rose up and they took control of all the official records 
and they burnt it. And then we have another one, which is actually more representative uh, of the uh, Ulkada uh, seizing power. They kind of seized power and took over the state. Over time, of course, a few years later, they were replaced, but they had actually proved the point. Okay? And again, in England, when we had the London Rise in 1456 to 1458, again, it was due to taxation to pay for debt. And in the case of Cologne, you can see it was serial. And then even if we say, look uh, at the uh, Dutch revolt, which lasted 80 years against the Spanish Habsburgs, it was because they had to pay so much debt. And the reason, again, for the English Civil War and the French Revolution was, again, the state was taxing too much to pay for the debt. So you can see that even though we had had this innovation in terms of uh, national debt, people who were at the very bottom were paying for it. That wealth was accumulating at the top, and there came a point when the whole thing just collapsed. And in a sense, as we'll kind of see uh, later on, nothing has changed. So if we kind of go back now, move a few more hundred years into the future, to around 1800, so these are, if you like, the four main bond cycle defaults. So, so if we kind of look at the yellow bits, the yellow bits are where people are just not paying or the states are not paying. So we had the first one around 1820s. So that would have been just after the Napoleonic Wars. And then we had the second one in the 1870s and 1880s. The third one we had around the 1930s, uh, just after the uh, Wall Street crash. And the final one was what we had in the 1980s and 1990s. Strangely enough, the one in 2008 doesn't feature because there weren't that many defaults. There was a lot of renego uh, renegotiation and other dodgy things done, but there weren't really any defaults. So, so then the question is, is, is that we haven't really solved that problem. Is that even though the, uh, the um, regulations and the rules favor the creditors, the maxim that if people can't pay, they won't pay, still holds. So we have, first of all, the debt crisis of the 1820s. And that, again, goes back to what was happening in Latin America. So during that time, the Latin American states were fighting wars. They needed to borrow money. So how do you borrow money? You issue national debts. Okay? And then, of course, once you fought your wars, you don't really have much to pay. And of course, you then uh, default. So th there was an example of Peru in 1826, actually, suspends payments. In the case of Greece in 1823, when they were fighting the Ottoman Empire, they were actually uh, financing that fight by borrowing in the London market. And of course, once they'd actually got their uh, independence, they said, sorry guys, we just don't have enough money. So that then kind of uh, went on for a while, uh, with the British government constantly threatening to actually invade uh, Greece which they actually did in 1854 jointly with the French on the basis that they were being, uh, if you like, irresponsible in helping the Russians in the Crimean War. Okay? And then, of course, you, know, you have Portugal in 1828 and uh, Spain in 1831 against defaulting. The interesting one is Mexico, which actually goes to the uh, second debt crisis, but again, it's kind of here. And in 1861, the British, the French, and the Spanish went in, invaded Mexico, only to be booted out a few years later by the Mexican forces. So you can, you can see that there has been this constant power struggle between the debtors and the creditors. So even though we have had lots of innovation, the fundamental thing hasn't moved, that there is still, if people don't have enough money, they're not going to pay. So then we go into the second of the crisis. So that, again, was in the 1860s and 1870s. Now, you would think that people would remember that there were those uh, losses in the 1820s. Uh, it, 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 people you know, or institutions very, very quickly forget that they lost their monies. So we had a, a number of those things. You can see, you know, first of all, the Ottoman Empire, Egypt, the usual Latin American suspects not paying. In the case of the Ottoman Empire, they effectively were taken over indirectly. And in the case of uh, Egypt, they were taken over full sale. You know, Egypt ceased to be an independent nation. And again, came down to that. So this, is, this graph is, uh, gives you a sort of very good um, illustration of 
the debt crisis from 1865 to 1910. So, so you can see that a lot of the culprits or a lot of the countries are the same. You know, so you can see Mexico, Peru, Peru twice, and then Uruguay. Again, you can see Mexico. Again, you can see Mexico. And again, in the 20th century, you'll find the usual ones. Argentina, Mexico, Peru. So you can see that, you know, no matter what happens, you know, even though we have 5,000 years of history, the same, things, the same thing happens all the time. So... Uh, it's been estimated that if you had, if you had actually uh, issued debt, there would be something like a 30% chance of you, the country being taken over by foreign forces. So in the 20th century, the first one we saw was Venezuela, which, uh, whose ports were in effect bombarded by British, German, and Italian gunboats. Okay? And then between 1905 to 1929, the Dominican Republic was taken over because they were not able to pay their debt. Cuba was seriously taken over three times, and Haiti was effectively annexed by the US between 1915 and 1934. Now, the Haiti is an interesting case in point where debt has been used to deliberately destroy a country. So to give you the broad historical context, um, Haiti more or less fought for its independence around, I think, and they won around I think, 1804. Um, then France claimed that, well, you know, because you have taken over our property, et cetera, et cetera, you then have to pay us uh, uh, back. And for that, I think they charged them something like 90, 190 million uh, uh, francs of that time, which was in, in, in essence something like 24 billion US dollars as of 2004. So if you think of Haiti as a small nation paying all of that debt, and it took them I think 142 years to pay it back. Now the reason why the US forces went in was the French in the meantime had actually sold their debt to the US. So the US went in and, uh, and kind of actually bought it. But the other interesting thing is that during that time, the US did not go into any of the bigger Latin American countries. For obvious reasons, they would fight back. So the moral seems to be, if, if you're going to borrow, make sure you're a big country and, and borrow a lot and then, and, then do, uh, and then default, but don't borrow too much if you're a small country. So then that kind of takes us very much, if we kind of waste for another 100 years to the 1929 Wall Street crash. And during that time, at least 15 Euro European countries defaulted and 15 Latin American countries defaulted. So in essence, the whole system just broke down. And it didn't really kind of recover well into the 1960s. So then in the 20th century, after the Great Depression, we had the first Mexican debt crisis in the 1980s, and again, they wouldn't pay. And then, of course, we had the Argentinian debt crisis in the 1990s. Also, we also had the Russian debt crisis in 1998. So those things seem to be happening. And then that actually takes us to the 2008 uh, 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 and onwards. And in essence, again, all of this is just the issuance of too much debt to the wrong countries, depending uh, uh, on what it is, or to the wrong type of people. So. I think to explain the 2000 and debt, rather than uh, me explaining what really happened, let me take, give you a very short uh, introduction to it using the movie, the, 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 uh, the big shot. You smell that? You smell that? I smell money. This is amazing. Okay, hi. How are you? Have a seat. Okay, Mr. Bennett from Deutsche Bank. Here we have. There you go. So how many people have you talked to about this trade? A few. There's definitely some interest. Oh, my boss would have my ass. Yeah, no. Is he crazy, Jerry? Get lost, Jerry. Fuck you. Which is why you're here talking to us, wrong number. Sounds like there's a lot of interest. All right. A few people have invited us in just to laugh at me on this deal. Is that you? No. Is that what this is? That's not what this is. That's just how Mark is. 
Let's see what you got. I'm sorry. You smell that? What is that? What? What's that smell? The cologne? No. Opportunity. No, money. Oh, okay. I smell money. Okay. Chris? God damn it. Sorry. This is your basic mortgage bond. All right? The originals were simple. They were just thousands of AAA mortgages bundled together, guaranteed by the U.S. government. The modern ones are different. They're private, and they're made up of layers of tranches. The highest level AAA is getting paid first. The lowest rated B is getting paid last, taking on defaults first. Now, obviously, if you're buying Bs, you can make more money, but they're a little risky. Sometimes they fail. Chris? Somewhere along the line, these Bs and double Bs went from a little risky to dog shit. Where's the trash? Behind you. I'm talking rock bottom FICO scores. No income verification. Adjustable rates, dog shit. The default rates are already up from one to 4%, fellas. And if they rise to 8%, and they will, a lot of these triple Bs are going to zero too. And that, you're too close, is an opportunity. Okay, you're saying that at 8%, the bonds fail, and we are already at 4%? That's right. If they go to eight, it's Armageddon. Yeah, that's right. How come nobody's talking about this? You're completely sure of the math. Look at him. That's my quant. Your what? My quantitative. My math specialist. Look at him. You notice anything different about him? Look at his face. That's pretty racist. Look at his eyes. I'll give you a hint. His name's Yang. He won a national math competition in China. He doesn't even speak English. Yeah, I'm sure of the math. Actually, my name's Jiang, and I do speak English. Jared likes to say I don't because he thinks it makes me seem more authentic. And I got second in that national math competition. So you're offering us a chance to short this pile of blocks? How? With something called a credit default swap. It's like insurance on the bond, and if it goes bust, you can make 10 to 1, even 20 to 1 return, and it's already slowly going bust. 10 to 1, 20 to 1? No way. And no one's paying attention. No one is paying attention because the banks are too busy getting paid obscene fees to sell these bonds. But wait, you are the bank. I mean, you work for the bank. I bet your margins are pretty nice and fat. Let's not talk about my margins, by the way. Being nice and fat, that's a nice shirt. Do they make it for men? Aren't you the bank? I work for the bank. I don't think like a bank. Big bank, small bank, I like to make money, all right? Let me put it this way. I'm standing in front of a burning house, and I'm offering you fire insurance on it. How can these underlying bonds be as bad as you say? It wouldn't be legal. <clears throat> Nobody knows what's in them. Nobody knows what's in the bonds. I've seen some that are 65% triple-A rated, that I know for a fact are filled with 95% subprime shit with FICOs below 550. Get the fuck out of here. You want me to really blow your mind? When the market deems a bond too risky to buy, what do you think we do with it? Take a guess. I don't know, you tell me. All right. You think we just warehouse it on the books? No, we just repackage it with a bunch of other shit that didn't sell and put it into a CDO. A CDO? Yes, a CDO. What is that? This is where we take a bunch of Bs, double Bs, and triple Bs that haven't sold, and we put them in a pile. And when the pile gets large enough, the whole thing is suddenly considered diversified. And then the whores at the rating agency give it a 92, 93% AAA rating, no questions asked. Oh, oh, say that again. A collateralized debt obligation. It's important to understand because it's what allowed a housing crisis to become a nationwide economic disaster. Here's world famous chef Anthony Bourdain to explain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm a chef on a Sunday afternoon setting the menu at a big restaurant. I ordered my fish on Friday, which is the mortgage bond that Michael Flurry shorted but some of the fresh fish doesn't sell. I don't know why, maybe it just came out, halibut has the intelligence of a dolphin. So, what am I gonna do? Throw all this unsold fish, which is the triple B level of the bond, in the garbage, and take the loss? No way. 
Being the crafty and morally onerous chef that I am, whatever crappy levels of the bond I don't sell, I throw into a seafood stew. See, it's not old fish. It's a whole new thing. And the best part is they're eating three-day-old halibut. That is a CDO. Well, I just no, need to know how these could possibly be collated. No, so well, so somehow sorry, you're sorry, like the door of the explorer, and you're the first person who has found this thing. Hold on. So mortgage bonds are dog shit. CDOs are dog shit wrapped in cat shit. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Institutions treat these CDOs like they're as solid as treasury bonds, and they're going to zero. No, it can't be right. There, there were 500 billion in housing bonds sold last year alone. The ratings agencies, the banks, the fucking government. You're saying they're all asleep at the wheel? Yeah. My whole department's long on this stuff. They call me Chicken Little. They call me Bubble Boy. A's, zero. B's, zero. Double B's, zero. Triple B's, zero. And then that happened. Right, so that, I think, gives you an idea of what happened during the 2008 crisis, and the rest, as they say, is history, okay? So what that really meant was if, if there wasn't any significant intervention from the state, the entire banking sector would just collapse. So again, who pays for it, okay? It's again the common people. So that, in essence, lead, led to the age of austerity. Does it sound familiar? What happened in the Italian republics? And again, what happened in the classical age? You know, it, the problem is created else, uh, somewhere and someone else has to pay for it. So that, that seems to be the common theme. So, w but there were some interesting side effects of that crisis. One which was actually the reduction in interest rates, and that meant the cost of uh, government borrowing actually went down. And the other thing was negative interest rates. Now, that's actually a very, very rare phenomena. It has never happened in Europe. There has been issues with it in uh, Japan, but that's within a different context. So what I'm now going to do is actually switch tactic uh, tone and actually deal with some modern financial instrument. And in this particular case, what I have done is to actually download some data from the, uh, the US Fed and just to, again, to actually show you the kind of returns you would have uh, got if you had, say, invested in a one-year bond, the Fed. So as you can see, that, uh, those Fed, this one actually goes back to the 1960s and again, to the uh, to, to, to today, and as you can see, from at its at its height in the 1980s, you you know the return would have been 17 and a half percent. Okay, now you think, well, okay, what's the deal with that? But if we then sort of go a little bit down, and then just focus on it from 2010 onwards, you can see, in essence. What happened was we're practically at zero. This is a very, very rare historical phenomenon in the West. It's never happened like this before. Now, if we were to repeat the same thing on a slightly longer bond, that's a 10-year one. Again, you can see similar patterns. And again, you can see it's not as low, but it's again very, very close to zero during, the, during that period. So, and then if we just look at one more, and that's for a 30-year bond. So you kind of invest for 30 years, okay? And again, you can see in the 80s, you know, you, you, you would have got 15%, and by the time it was 2020 during the, uh, the, during the COVID crisis, you would have got just under 2.5%. So in historical terms, what the government had to pay to borrow was very, very low. But what governments decided to do was, in essence, cut back on their borrowing and hence the age of austerity. Okay. So, so again, you can see in this particular case, that that's a 30-year 30, 30 one, and again, it's uh, from 2010 onwards. Now, the next one, which I kind of want to have you have a look at, so this is the previous slides was a specific financial instrument, a bond of a particular maturity. So we have another uh, workhorse in, in finance, which is what we call the yield curve. 
And what the yield curve does is really plots the return of a, investing in a particular bond against the maturity of the bond. So let's say, for example, in this particular case, you had, say, invested on a five-year bond, then, then in, this, uh, in the case of the 2004 date, your return would have been something like 3.5%. Now, if we sort of look at the first two curves, so, so the one at the top is, they have just taken random dates. What is on 6th of September, 2004, you can see that if you say invested in a 30-year bond, you would have been paying 5%. Okay? If you say had invested in a five-year bond, you'd have been paying around 3.5%. Okay? If we then kind of move now to uh, to, today, March, uh, or last week, March 2023, when interest rates are going up again, you can see they're kind of going up again, but not as high. Now, before I look at this, uh, this particular plot, the final one, I'd like to show you a Monty Python video. <laughs> For the wife. Oh, uh, 20 shekels. Right. What? There you are. Wait a minute. Oh, well, we're, we're supposed to haggle. No, 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 I've got to get... What do you mean, no, no, no? I haven't got time. Well, I've give got... it back then. No, 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 I just paid you. What? Yeah. This bloke won't haggle. Won't haggle? All right, do we have to? Now, look, I want 20 for that. I just gave you Now, are you telling me that's not worth 20 shekels? No. Look at it. Feel the quality. That's not in your goat. All right, I'll give you 19, then. No, no, no. Come on, do it properly. What? Haggle properly. This isn't worth 19. You just said it was worth 20. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Come on, haggle. All right, I'll give you 10. That's more like it. 10? Are you trying to insult me? Me with a poor dying grandmother? 10? All right, I'll give you 11. Now you're getting it. 11? Did I hear you right? 11? This cost me 12? You want to ruin me? 17? No, 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 no. 17. 18? No, no. You get a 14 now. All right, I'll give you 14. 14? Are you joking? That's what you told me to say. Oh, dear. Oh, tell me what to say, please. Offer me 14. I'll give you 14. He's offering me 14 for this. 15. 17. My last word. I won't take a penny less or strike me dead. 16. Done. Nice to do business with you. Oh. Tell you what, I'll throw you in this as well. I don't want it, but thanks. But uh, yes. All right, all right. Oops. So, the whole point of that video is that it's actually absolutely ridiculous. And the reason why I kind of introduced that video is just to kind of highlight that particular slide, if so. I'm just going to actually use the pointer here. So, we have a very unique situation of negative rates. And what negative rates mean is that, imagine you're going for a mortgage, okay? And you go to the bank and you say, well, okay, will you lend me some money? The bank says, of course, I, we will give you some money, but you have to pay us interest on it. In this particular case, the bank is paying you to borrow money from them. So not only do you not get that money, the bank is uh, giving you extra amount of money because they've had the privilege of actually lending you the money. And so this actually refers to the Eurozone area. So for a while, when the German government or the, Euro or the ECB issued debt, they were actually charging it far more than it was worth. Now this only happened until the pandemic and so during the pandemic and it's gone back again. But we've never seen a scenario like this in the West since, this, well, since ever. So, so it's a completely ridiculous situation, and there was something clearly wrong with the market. Now, clearly things have gone up again, but it gives you an idea where, where we were. Now, if we move on to the next slide, sorry. Uh, so this one, so this one is um, the UK debt since 1692. Now, if you look at the particular de debt cycles here against GDP, okay, you can see around 1850, and after the Second World War, and during the Second World War, it was actually very, very high. Currently, it is only, well, it's here, it's because it goes to 2022, 
it's around 100%. Now it's probably around 90% because of the uh, inflation. Okay, so you can see that during that time, from 2000 onwards, during the financial crisis, it went up. But within a broad historical context, UK debt is actually very, very low. So let me show you this graph okay, of the debt, debt to GDP ratios uh, for all the countries that actually provide their records. And you can see in the case of uh, Japan is 257%, poor Greece is 207 and the UK is actually in the third category or second category if I can see it. So UK is actually over here it doesn't really have, in broad, broad sense of the word, not that much debt. Okay? Which then actually poses the question why there were tantrums in the bond market when Lee's Trust decided to actually start borrowing money. So before she actually became prime minister, there was an interesting article uh, by... Kwasi Kwarteng in the FT, where he argued that, well, as a nation, we don't really have that much debt, so we can borrow. Fair enough. But the issue is this. Why did the bond markets went into tantrum? Time for another video, I think. And this time, Nostalgic 80s. It all comes down to, it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, the Banana Rama song, it ain't what you do, it's the way that you do it, okay? And Liz Truss should have actually been a Banana Rama fan. If she was, she would still be a prime minister today, okay? So in terms of what she was trying to do, she wasn't really being unreasonable, uh, given where the country was, it was just the way, the language she was using, and it was the speed at which she was going. If there was another thoughtful prime minister, he or she would have got away with it. The other lesson that Liz Truss didn't understand is that Britain is no longer a major imperial power. We can't do what we want to do. So to contrast with what Liz Truss is trying to do, the US has actually passed the Inflation Reduction Act where they are borrowing close to a trillion dollars. The market didn't do anything. But in, cases, in the case of Liz, saying, right, we're not going to buy British bonds. And in essence, if it was better executed, it wouldn't have worked. But my other point is that what Liz Truss did should have been done at the end of 2008, when it was obvious that interest rates, rates were going down, it was time to borrow money. Instead, what they did was they actually battled down, battled down and then they uh, reduced effective borrowing and cut back. And that in turn has currently now led us to the cost of living crisis. Okay. Now, you know, you can argue, well, inflation has gone up, uh, there is a Ukraine war, COVID has come in, but the underlying foundational basis for the cost of living crisis is due to the age of austerity. If, if we go back slightly, for example, here, now, this is for taken for the ECB, for the UK government, uh, for the US government, it shows a very similar trend, 
Okay? Clearly not as marked, so UK government bonds never went to negative rates, but essentially the same uh, thing. So if you say can borrow for 30 or 40 years at 2%, why not borrow? And what Liz Truss was trying to do was do precisely that, but she was just at the wrong time. And that's really what got her into trouble. Things have just moved on. So that, in turn, if you like, led to uh, tantrums in the bond market. And that essentially meant that the bond market were more or less becoming illiquid. If, so if everybody takes, goes, takes the same position, so if everybody wants to sell the same thing, the prices go, goes down. And the reason why it happened was, again, if we go back to the, say, the issue of 2008 uh, crisis, too much leverage, leverage. So what the pension funds were doing was they were using what are called interest rate swaps. Now, interest rate swaps, uh, they look uh, simple enough when you actually teach them, but they're actually phenomenally dangerous instruments because an interest rate swap is really a series of forward rates. So a forward rate or a forward contract in finance is where you agree to do something at a future date. And it's a compulsory act. If you do not actually uh, uh, fulfill that contract, you are in breach. So, so what the pension funds had done is they have said, well, okay, we will take the fixed rate from a third, second party and we will pay in floating. So they, now they would actually keep some uh, cash back to pay for odd month here or there. But when the interest rates went up by something like 3.6% in a short period of time, they didn't have enough cash to pay, pay back. So that meant they actually had to go into the market and sell the bonds. Now, because the other party knew that they were in trouble, the bond prices went down. And this is effectively what happened, and the Bank of England came in. Okay? And this thing we see every time. So when we had the 1987 stock market crash, that was with portfolio insurance. Again, liquidity was an issue. And then when we have the uh, uh, bearings crisis of 1994, same thing happened. When we had the Russian crisis of 1998, the same thing happened. And when we had the 2008 crisis, again, the same thing happened. And we've seen that. So it, it seems, you know, it's like just like in the bond market, people never learn. And it just keeps on happening on a, on a regular every 15, 20 years. So I've kind of talked about the past, the present. It's now actually time to talk about the future. And let me kind of start with uh, J.K. Galbraith's uh, very humorous uh, description of forecasting. He said the only function of economic forecasting is to make astrology look respectable. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy for that, but it's, it's not always right. It at least gives us something to hold on to. So what are my predictions okay, for the next 20, 30 years? Well, first of all, I think we are going to see a number of defaults by emerging economies. So we've already seen that in the case of Sri Lanka. It would not surprise me if Pakistan went through the same way and also some of the African states did the same. And, and I think just as importantly, there would be significant damage to our social infrastructure in both de developed and the developing nations. And that would be the UK. We get, we're kind of seeing that already in the cost of living crisis. And my other point is that the age of austerity was really a seminal mistake by Britain. And I would actually rank it with the First World War and also the fact that the uh, Great Britain did not join the EU at the start. It's one of those mistakes. And that will actually set much of the, uh, the scene for the first half of the 21st century. So it would not surprise me that even say uh, by 2030 or even 2040, we're still dealing with some of the uh, consequences of that. So let me sort of just give you one bit of information. So I think when we kind of look at emerging economies, one of the things that is actually looked, uh, sort of we kind of use as a proxy, is what is the average height of the male or the female? And if you sort of say look at uh, countries that are doing well, say for example, Bangladesh, what you see is that the average height has actually gone up over time, for, say for, during the last 20, 30 years. 
we, can prob we will probably see the reverse of that in the UK in 10, 15 years' time, where the average height of a child will go down. And that will come down to basic nutrition and so forth. It's just that the basic social infrastructure has been damaged. So let me kind of conclude uh, this uh, lecture with my final maxim that history, I know history repeats itself not as a farce, but as a tragedy. But I know it's the other way around or there's a combination of it. But in my sort of, in this inaugural lecture, what I try to highlight is the importance of debt and how debt often le leads to tragedy, very often for the common man. Now, when debt is actually used uh, in a very constructive way, it is also one of the most uh, positive aspects of our, uh, of our existence. So, for example, after the Second World War, Germany was allowed to forego some of its debt. It was given time to pay uh, the remaining debt, and not only that, it was actually allowed to pay that debt in its own currency. So a lot of flexibility was allowed. If we were to see that same kind of flexibility today, a lot of the problems which uh, the emerging countries, for example, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and some of the other African countries that will come to the fore in the, in the next few years would have been, would be dealt with. Okay, thank you. Questions? <laughs>